I think we're live. We're live. Welcome, everyone, uh, to our panel discussion on operating carbon-free building. This is the second in a series of discussions on what it will take to build the path to 2050 and carbon-free buildings. My name is Fernando Arias, and I'm delighted to moderate today's discussion as Clark's National Director of Sustainability. And I'd also like to present you uh, my co-host for today's session, Teresa Bacchus, who's the Associate Director at the Building Innovation Hub. Thank you, Fernando, and welcome everyone. On behalf of the Building Innovation Hub, uh, another big thank you to Fernando and to Clark Construction and all of our panelists today. Uh, and thank you also to everyone who's in attendance. We're really excited for this operations-focused conversation um, because it comes at a, at a critical juncture in time. Uh, as you may know, the District of Columbia buildings account for over 70% of carbon emissions. So we must reduce building-related operational emissions in order to achieve um, our collective climate goals. Uh, and a little bit of background, the hub was created with support from DC's Department of Energy and the Environment, uh, and also the support of our founding members, with Clark Construction being one of those members, to help us realize this goal through four key actions. So first, connecting members of, of our building community to one another, like we're doing today. Um, second, fostering uh, critical and sometimes challenging conversations about how the various subsections of our industry can work together to comply with the district's building energy performance standards. Um, third, making high-performing buildings the new normal. And finally, but certainly not least, helping people to realize that there are many benefits of high-performing buildings beyond simply compliance with regulation. So uh, I'm sure, as you have experienced, um, the various roles that affect a building's life cycle can be pretty segmented. Um, and the hub is focused on connecting all of these sectors in order to help you understand how various roles interact in order to create best-in-class buildings. And like I said in our first panel, in the design panel, when I say best in class, we include energy efficiency, um, resilience, human health, and equity as foundational principles. So we act as a hub of information and connection, hence our name, the hub, um, offering a full suite of resources as well as events like this one um, that bring together industry leaders to have these um, conversations and think creatively. So, as I said, we're at a moment of, of a pretty unique opportunity. There's growing awareness in the role um, or of the role that building operations play in climate action and in our health and our communities. So let's get to work to make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And I, I really want to also underscore that as part of the hub's mission to not only connect and foster discussions pertinent to matters related to the region here, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia region. We also want to express that through the composition of these discussions and the panelists that represent different sectors and different points of view, there's many exportable and importable ideas both into the district and beyond. So um, I, I feel as though our conversation today will help to uh, give some breadth of scope to that uh, point of view as well. So with that, let me now pivot to discussing our format for today. Um, to let the attendees know, we will have about 45 minutes or more of discussion where I will moderate our panel and guide us through our conversation about what it will take to operate carbon-free buildings. Then thereafter, for about 20 minutes or more, um, there will be a segment of Q&A. You can feel free to type questions into the chat in your portal uh, and during the discussion, uh, many of these different uh, chat questions will be forwarded to me by my team um, so that ultimately we can prepare some of these questions for all of the speakers to respond to at the end of the program. So with that, I'd like to now um, present to you our selected panel and my esteemed industry colleagues. Excellent, everybody's here. So uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you today's panel, and we're going to go in alphabetical order and allow each of them to tell you a little bit about themselves and their work, 
Um, and uh, maybe they'll uh, share with you uh, one fun fact or something that they'd like you to also take away and remember. So I'll start with Jeremy Alcorn. Fernando, thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with this esteemed panel. Uh, Again, I'm Jeremy Alcorn. I am with, uh, I'm a Senior Sustainability Program Manager with the U.S. General Services Administration. Uh, I basically look at, and you know, I'm the sustainability lead for many of our 8,800 uh, own and leased assets that cover about 370 million square feet. Ultimately, uh, you know, it sounds very serious, but I think, you know, when it comes down to it, having a passion for people and buildings, again, buildings or places, but the people inside of them, the work they do is really the important part. So taking it as Fernando's cube, a fun fact, something that's sticking your brain, just as sustainability can be a risky proposition sometimes, uh, one of my favorite uh, undergraduate activities was actually to jump into a, an aquarium with, full of sharks. And you aptly survived all that, which is great. I, I did. I did. L luckily, nurse, nurse sharks are not that aggressive, but we had a couple of scorpion fish that were a little too friendly. That's good to know. I didn't know that about you. I like that, Jeremy. Nice to, nice to uh, greet you for our panel today. Now, I'd like to invite uh, Kara Carmichael to say hello um, and let us know a little bit about you and your work. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Fernando. And Jeremy, it's good to have you with us today after swimming with sharks. Um, I'm a principal at, in RMI's buildings program. Um, I've been working on zero energy projects and programs and portfolios for over two decades now and really trying to find cost effective pathways to decarbonize our building stock. So um, I think some of my recent passions to that extent are really around demand flexibility and how our buildings can serve as this tremendous grid resource by, you know, flexing when we use energy to align with when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing on the grid. So we've been doing a lot of analysis that I've been leading internally about how much that value is both to us as building owners and occupants, as well as to the greater system in the grid. And I've also been working a lot in the state of New York on the carbon neutral buildings roadmap. So setting a comprehensive kind of policy, economic, technical, you know, the whole vision for how we're gonna decarbonize New York's building stock. They have some of the most aggressive um, goals in the country. So tying that all together, I'm really excited to be here with you all today and sharing, sharing those insights. I think one fun fact I could offer is I am a hockey player. I play ice hockey. I've played it my whole life and wow. was lucky enough, you know, in high school and college both to go to nationals. So played at a really competitive level. And now I just, I enjoy milling around with the sharks on the ice. So. Don't play with Kara. She'll come, you know, she'll check you. That's great. Great to know uh, that about you as well, Kara. It's really nice. Um, and of course, I have deep respect for your work, so I can't wait for you to tell us a lot more about that. Um, now over to Krista Egger. Uh, say hello, Krista. Welcome to the panel. Hi. Thanks so much, Fernando, and really pleased to be here with everyone today. Um, a little bit about my organization, Enterprise Community Partners. We um, are a national nonprofit in the affordable housing space. So that's the, the unique angle I'll be bringing to today's conversation. We develop programs to create high quality affordable housing. We advocate for policy at the federal, state, local level. We invest capital to build and preserve homes that people can afford. And we own and manage um, affordable housing also. So we've um, built and preserved nearly 800 thousand um, homes across the country invested more than six point billion dollars so that's the scale the organization the context i'm coming from and for me personally um, i lead our sustainability work and i co-lead our resilience work so trying to scale sustainability practices throughout the affordable housing country that includes our green communities platform and our resilience academies that we're launching later this fall and and some other work um, and the fun fact about me, um, Kara, it's interesting you use the term shark 
you know, in, in your fun fact, and Jeremy, you really started us out that way. And actually mine is kind of related to water. Also, I am a relatively new paddler and next week I'm taking a vacation and it's going to be a week long kayaking and camping. Really excited to get off grid and, and on the water. So that sounds again. beautiful. Wow. That sounds great, Krista. Well, um, glad that you're able to get back out there and enjoy some outdoors traveling this year. So um, send you all the best uh, wishes for your trip. Um, and now I'd like to pivot, uh, definitely uh, not least, to Ms. Bing Liu. Uh, welcome to the panel, Bing. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, my name is Bing Liu. I'm the building sector manager at the Pacific North National, National Lab, in short, PNL. PNL is one of the DOE, uh, Department of Energy's National Lab, and we're one of the four primary uh, national labs to support, to support uh, uh, DOE's Building Technologies Office. Um, I'm uh, responsible for the uh, strategic planning and implementation of PNL's uh, building portfolio. I also lead their building decarbonization, electrification, greater building integration effort as well. And the most re most recently, uh, I'm uh, I'm serving on the ASHRAE's task force for building decarbonization and chair the Building Performance Standards uh, Working Group under their uh, task force, and also serve as a member of their Building Degree Intersection Working Group. So um, I have quite some interaction uh, with some of the organizations um, you're um, working on here uh, as well. Um, just a little bit of short uh, introduction of our uh, PNL as a national lab, since Fernando reminded me uh, what kind of the portfolio looks like uh, we have about 5,000 researchers, and we, our main campus is located in Richland, Washington State, and we also have site office in Portland, uh, around the D.C. areas, uh, Port, um, Seattle, and Sequim. And we host about uh, $2.3 million square, uh, uh, gross square footage and across the uh, 80 buildings uh, on campus. Um, Richland is our main campus. Um, about a fun factor, um, this year I actually um, realized it's a mark the uh, eco years um, I spent in China and the United States. I grew up in China and got my, all my education in China. So from now on, I will stay, uh, I mean, embrace my new country longer in my motherland <laughs> from this year and the move on. Um, <laughs> I don't know if one would call that four fun factor or, su or, or such. Just take along with Krista was saying is um, my husband scheduled a paddle backpacking trip in North Cascade. You have to get a lottery permit to get that on, and to gain the permits is 25%. So we're pretty lucky, but this is really, it, it's, it's just scary to me to, to, to be on the water. And <laughs> anyway, I hope. Um, towards the end of the August, I will be survived and come back. <laughs> it will be totally off the grade because there's no cell phone signals in the North Cape area. <laughs> Which means good luck under the... Of course, the of course. I don't know if it's a vacation or it's a uh, boot camp punishment. So, we'll see. <laughs> ah, boot camp punishment. Well, I think it's lovely to hear that all of us are thinking about some travel this year and... Um, I think on that high note regarding how we're returning to some kind of a normalcy around our everyday experience, I think that this topic is really uh, urgent. And so when we think about the new behaviors that are going to become part of the way that we occupy buildings and the facilities folks that are going to um, support that, the energy managers that are going to work in many of these buildings, we wanted to take this opportunity to think through three key concepts. And so for the attendees, as a preview, I'm going to go through a round of questions, very simply organized around what the speakers think are opportunities, what they think are challenges, and what kind of jobs or skills uh, we might need in order to realize some of these opportunities. And so under that theme, we're gonna start with opportunities first. And I'd like to punt it to uh, 
Jeremy to see how he would like to kick us off thinking about what are the opportunities behind operating carbon-free buildings. Sure. Thank you, Fernando. So, I mean, in opportunities, this is really, I think, I've been seeing over my career, I've been about 20 years work, working with buildings and a lot with greenhouse gas uh, inventories. And when you start looking at the numbers on this and, you know, my last five years I've been working in facilities operations. You know, I think as Teresa mentioned, you know, have such buildings have such a big impact for uh, scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. Really, where those opportunities they break down into really four simple areas, and one of them happens to be you know, near and dear as an energy manager to my heart. You know, focusing on the efficiency of the building. You know, you have the buildings that you have, uh, and you want to focus and make them the best buildings they can be, as efficient as they can be. You know, with what you have or with what you can augment it with. Second really is about as you get to equipment end of life where you're looking at you know renovations and alterations or even major modernizations, what are your fuel switching opportunities? Um, can you go from say a natural gas or fuel oil boiler, which has a lot of O&M uh, associated with it and has a lot of greenhouse gas emissions to an electric, uh, elect electrified building, which opens up many of the possibilities I know Kara is gonna talk about. Third is looking at, you know, even at that same equipment, um, many of the things that, you know, folks will realize there's big machines and uh, machinery and equipment that has one of the lifespans. But just as we went through a transition in the, in the 90s from ozone depleting substances, we're seeing that as well with refrigerants. Refrigerants uh, make up around 14% of, of, of our scope one inventory. Uh, that's, that's significant. Uh, that is a really big part of our inventory, and it's also one of, one of those areas from that has a lot of change going on with the EPA regulations that are, are being proposed. So ultimately, looking at all those those two things, the fuel, the refrigerants, as we look into it, but the, the fourth item and opportunity that's it's really out there is both you know on our on site with our buildings as well as off site, and that really comes down to the renewables and carbon-free pollution and electricity that uh, we strive to get because even as we would transition uh, from some fossil fuels in our buildings and that equipment, you know, making sure we can feed it with renewable and clean energy uh, is a really important part. So four simple things that aren't so simple to implement, but also are really make it, you know, great opportunities each within themselves, but very much so when we put them together. I agree. Very good. Thank you, Jeremy, for setting that context. Over to you, Kara. Opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Fernando. And Jeremy, I think that's kind of the perfect nucleus of the recipe for decarbonization in our buildings. That's exactly what we need to do at the heart of it. And I think the opportunities I saw are kind of surrounding that. And um, I, I, I think that there are three opportunities that get me really excited these days. The first is the opportunities to improve our health then the opportunities to make these retrofits super cost effective by right timing them. And then the third kind of a technical passion of mine is demand flexibility that I talked a little bit about. But on the health front, um, what we've, we're finding is that um, our, our buildings are making us sick and our homes in particular. And we spend an awful lot of time in indoors. 90% um, is kind of the common statistic. And um, a recent Harvard study came out that said in 2017, we hit a tipping point where the sum of emissions from gas and biomass and wood burned in not only industrial plants, but also in our buildings, that surpassed the negative air quality contribute, contributions um, from coal plants. So our what we're doing inside our buildings is actually worse than the coal plant contributions um, that have historically been provided. Um, so I think that's a big, you know, emphasis on electrification, as Jeremy mentioned. Um, this carries huge financial implications where um, what we found is that the health burden from all these stationary sources of emissions, the pollutants, costs up to $205 billion per year. Um, including methane leakage and the gas that we're that we're burning in our in our buildings. So I, again, I think it 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 points again, you know, to this whole suite of benefits. And I think one quote, as I was kind of 
poking around on the Building Innovation Hub website that has really stuck with me is um, this. The person who manages your building has a bigger impact on your health than your doctor. And this came from a doctor, Dr. Joseph Allen from Harvard. So I, I, I think that's pretty, pretty telling what we do in our buildings matter. So briefly on the other two pieces, I think right timing your retrofits. Um, we've been working with ULI over the past couple of years on an approach called zero over time. And um, something that Fernando mentioned right off the top is like, we need to start sequencing our retrofits in line with their normal um, turnover cycle. So how can we achieve zero, uh, zero carbon buildings uh, by maximizing our investment cycle, taking advantage of turnover, equipment turnover life cycles, um, so that we're really focusing on doing the right measures at the right time. Um, and I think that'll lead to the most cost-effective decarbonization solutions. And then demand flexibility, the third. Um, <laughs> what we saw is that we have um, a, a lack of control of our buildings. So in COVID times, when our commercial office buildings were, uh, they occupancy went down by 90%, yet energy use only went down by like 20 or 30%. Mm -hmm. We're not using energy um, commensurate to the, the tax that we're putting on our buildings, the usage that we're using them for. So I think that just opens up a huge opportunity and our, a need uh, to better control our buildings. Thanks. Great points, Kara. You know, thank you so much for also introducing the human element and ensuring that we're thinking about this as not only some abstract environmental benefit, but it also has quality of life, uh, you know, uh, impacts that we want to make sure are included in the um, considerations. And so thank you for setting the context on that. Krista, over to you. Opportunities. Yeah, thanks. Um... Definitely three cheers for the opportunities that Jeremy and Kara both both shared. I think what I would add add to that list are are a few more from the perspective of the affordable housing sector and three areas in particular. On the one hand, with new construction properties in the affordable housing sphere, really believe that um, any property with affordability restrictions or subsidies could be, can be designed and operated with the realities of our future climate in mind as they are managed for at least 30 year um, cycles. And on the other hand, with our existing stock, you know, in the affordable housing sphere, we talk a lot about affordable housing preservation, which is a term that really means ensuring that we're not losing any number of affordable units to, to the market rate sector. And I think um, the only way that we'll be sure to achieve those preservation goals is to design and operate with realities of our future climate in mind um, to ensure that operating expenses aren't exacerbated, for instance. Um, but the largest opportunity that I'd really like to highlight is around equity. You know, um, our housing affordability, climate, and racial equity challenges are each threat multipliers, if you will, to one another and exacerbate threats to stable communities. And we really see that healthy and efficient and resilient affordable homes are essential to environmental and economic justice. And without fairly significant change about how we're designing and operating our buildings, the impacts of our changing climate um, will not be and are not born equally. Um, people with lower incomes and people of color are more likely to live in the hottest neighborhoods, for instance. Um, last year, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill published a study that um, looked at a number of cities across the United States, and they found that in 97% of the study of the cities that they looked at, people of color were exposed to temperatures two degrees hotter than white residents. Um, and so that's a direct physical impact, right, that we can start to adjust. There's also financial impact um, where low-income and underserved communities pay a greater percentage of their income for energy. And, you know, I live in Washington, D.C., and in D.C., the median energy burden of black households is 70 percent higher than non-Hispanic white households. So there's a direct opportunity for, for racial equity, especially as we see that the number of extreme high heat days, for instance, is, is on an extreme upward trajectory. So 
taking um, a commitment to um, carbon neutrality when we're designing and operating buildings to have a direct impact on the on the lives of people who are least served by our by our communities today. So that's that's what I'll add for opportunities. We have a opportunity to shift. Yeah, and you know, Chris, I really also appreciate that you bring into the the sphere of our conversation the topic about heat island effect and the ways in which many neighborhoods and cities are at a disadvantage. Perhaps they've lost some of their urban forest. Um, they, they have less infrastructure, uh, a green infrastructure enabled in, in their communities. And so I appreciate that, you know, we'll be able to introduce a variety of both technical and mechanical concepts about operating carbon-free buildings. But then there are also some pretty passive strategies um, that need to be also considered, including uh, the investment in green infrastructure, green roofs, uh, 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 plantings of all kinds um, to balance mm -hmm. out that heat island effect impact, which sometimes is not something that is included in this sort of understanding. Um, so Bing, over to you. Uh, what are your thoughts about opportunities to operate carbon-free buildings? Um, I have been working in the building energy efficiency uh, code standard areas over um, 25 years. I, I, I have to say I have not seen such amount of the opportunity in front of us to do things right, uh, both for um, decarbonize existing building and also design, build, construct new construction right from the beginning. And we create the low carbon built environment. I really appreciate what um, Kara has been mentioned, you know, towards the end of the day, what we really need to provide is in terms of the built environment, it has to be healthy, health has to be equitable, have, have to be resilient and safe, right? And also I want to add one more thing is to be smart, to be responsible to the grid as well. So um, with the current administration's commitment to bring our economy to, to clean energy future I, and with the refocus of the federal and the state investment, you know, for both for existing building, new construction, I think there's really, really tons of opportunities. But I do like, uh, you know, as a researcher, I can talk about their technologies, you know, all day long. But I also want to highlight one uh, particular opportunity that related to uh, our own campus. You know, we, as I mentioned, we have um, over 80 buildings on, camp on our Richland campus. And uh, as you can imagine, as a research national lab, we have a typical office buildings, but we also have heavily used wet labs with a lot of ventilations which is a mechanical engineer, I'm sure appreciate what I'm talking about as well. It's very, very heavy energy intense usage and some of the supercomputer rooms and the data center, et cetera. So we made a commitment to have our campus be net zero emission operation, 24-7 uh, operation by the year 2030. We have nine years working on it. It's a huge commitment from the lab and with the support of DOE. So we have nine years to um, make our campus. The 24-7 is means is not just averagely per year, we have we try to reach net zero carbon is at is also at any hours there um, through the combination of their efficiency and on-site uh, distributed energy resources, we want to draw their energy, provide a comfort, but uh, zero um, uh, carbon emission. And I'm also very glad what uh, um, Jeremy has been mentioned is we have a very similar strategy. We have a four R strategy to make our campus, our own campus as a living lab and show, just show the rest of, show our region and others it is possible, even for energy intense a national lab uh, campus. Our four R, I would just quickly said is first is reduce. A lot of study is showing in our buildings, at least, you know, easily be 30% energy is waste energy, 
we really need through the retuning controls, you know, the basic low hanging fruit to reduce energy use in our building without sacrificing the comfort. The second one is replacement. I heard other panels that uh, panelists say the same thing. We have to go to the turnover cycle of the you know equipment and uh, uh, replacement. And when the cycle is right, replace, replace high efficient electric system with your you know um, uh, greenhouse gas emission heavy equipment. Do that right when you get a chance to retrofit, replace on the natural you know turnover cycle. The third R I really want to emphasize is resiliency. I live in Portland, and a few weeks ago, Portland, we made a national highlight again, and we have 117 degrees, historic record. We don't want that historic record because, you know, 50% of our single family house owners, we don't have air conditioner at all, and then we see the high death rate during that one week. It's really, really sad to see that happening. So building our building right is actually helping improve our comfort, health, and resilience in terms of extreme weather. We see more and more happening. Of course, as a national lab, we cannot forget last R is our research. So our campus, we are testing a lot of emerging technology, such as transactive controls, you know, smart controls, technology on our own campus. And we want to take all the lessons learned, then we can bring the best proven practical uh, practice, uh, particularly in the grid building, in the grid control areas to other buildings. But we like to test on our own campus. So that's uh, uh, kind of in a nutshell opportunity we see. And um, it's very exciting for us to walk to work in terms of the decarbonize our own campus. Thank you, Bing. Yeah, I think you bring up something as well. In in addition to the the various colorful and important technical things that you brought up, I I as I segue to discuss with all of you the challenges, I also would like to uh, see if I can evoke from you um, a little bit more unpacking about the difference between new construction versus renovations or retrofits. This is a theme that came up in many of your remarks, and so I'd love to see if you can call out some of your perspectives about the scenarios and the differences, especially as we think about in the affordable housing sector, there might be some very germane opportunities, some very applicable examples that could translate to non-commercial buildings, whereas, for example, in the portfolio that the GSA or PNL manages, is going to translate a little bit more to institutional, academic, and commercial buildings. So with that, I'm gonna go in reverse order, and Bing, I'll bring it back to you. If you could help us to think about what you see are challenges to operating carbon-free buildings, and you know maybe perhaps address this a little bit from the retrofit versus new construction point of view. Thank you, thank you, um, Fernando. The challenges is um, for the uh, new constructions, particularly, you know, we know there's a lot of uh, electrification technologies that has been uh, extremely um, underutilized. You know, we are in the uh, industry, I will not call us uh, conservative, but it is a very uh, risk reverse industry, right? You mm -hmm. have to put in your lab works, you know, with very low cost design construction, years and years, that's what you know what to do. So try something new. It is a very high capital um, to do so. So I think for, uh, for the technology for new construction has been significantly underused. And also the integrated design for new construction I don't think it's a common norm. We really need to move that to the norm. So you can have fast envelope you can think about to design and bring the daylighting, bring the comfort, you know, to the occupant and reduce that capital cost of chillers. And I hope I don't, I'm not going to hear uh, another bowlers here. And, and I think it's going to be heat pump, you know. So to remove, the funny thing is a mechanical engineer, but I tell everyone is, if you can reduce anything moving and running, that's the best to do <laughs> because it's a less down the road helping to reduce the cost on the maintenance as well, right, of the complicated mechanical system. So 
I think the opportunity for a new construction is we are seeing the codes and the standard are moving really fast in charge moving fast. You know, we're talking about the national model codes, DOE just released um, a formative determination that will trigger state to adopt the new codes and uh, that helping us to build in the you know, new construction correctly. But keep that in mind, what, what's the meaning of the codes? The codes really for minimum bar to meet. And we do have a leading state and the cities, they already passed, you know, stretch codes and more aggressive, you know, standards. Uh, you can take a look, uh, you know, and also there's a lot of net zero building already operated in the country as well. Yeah. So and there's a lot like it yeah. sounded to me like also the integrative design approach might be able to help solve for a little bit of this knowledge gap around translating not only codes but some of the aspirational aspects of some of the new technologies that are currently in play yeah, yeah. Um, so with that let me pivot over to Krista so that I can try to give us a little bit more time toward the third question Krista what do you think are some of the challenges you see a little bit of the segment between new construction and renovation yeah, sure thing. Thanks. Um, you know, decarbonizing buildings without considering the financial implications on residents and overall operating budgets is is a challenge. Like in the affordable housing sector, where budgets, operating budgets for buildings are pretty set for either 15 or 30 years, um, and um, we're looking at not just some of the technical challenges and how you build operate or, or retrofit buildings, but some of the challenges around actually the, the how you how you keep the lights on <laughs> um, and how you're paying for it is, is a challenge. You know, that age old um, model of having separate budgets between the development side of the house and the operation side of the house is a challenge where um, you're looking at upfront costs rather than life cycle impacts on our ability to provide housing. Um, and then we're also looking at um, challenges of determining new ways of, of how to structure utility allowances for residents when we're looking at different rate structures for the fuels that are operating the building um, and just considering new and, and unintentional burdens. So much simpler on the new construction side to set it up, you know, when you're working from a, a blank slate. But, with the existing buildings, finding the right time, like like Kara was talking about, um, to implement upgrades, as well as really considering how um, you're going to weigh decisions between costs um, for operating um, the building or implementing decarbonization strategies versus energy sources that are available today um, versus your emissions profile. So. Um, those are, that's the variety of challenges that we're, we're looking at. And right now, you know, as different jurisdictions around the country are, are moving at different paces uh, towards decarbonization, what I think, what we're really interested in helping to craft is, is a roadmap um, that the affordable housing, players in the affordable housing sector can use, regardless of where you are in the country, to map out, you know, some of those different decision points. <laughs> um, so that we can start to at least demystify some of these challenges, even if we're not coming up with universal solutions, but making the questions at least easier to, to grapple with. Right. It sounded to me as well, Krista, as though more whole building LCAs as a component of the quantification on the return on investment is a big piece mm -hmm. that um, has been a challenge to enact. And I was also, through your comments, thinking a little bit about the building energy performance standard here in D.C. and how there is a path to achieve some of the goals of that program through prescriptive measures, things that sounded to me like weatherization opportunities even. So there are some low-hanging fruit. It's not as though we can't get to any action. I think that just as a progressive scale up to doing more pervasive changes, um, there might be some low-hanging fruit that uh, borrow a page or two from uh, weatherization, energy retrofits, et cetera. And I wonder, Kara, over to you, thinking about these challenges and your work in New York with NYSERDA, I wondered if um, you know you had additional points of view about the challenges that you're seeing. 
Yep, and great points being in, Krista. Um, I think the one thing that I would say about challenges is scale. We have 100 million buildings in the US and currently we only retrofit about 1% per year. Um, so we not only need to increase the retrofit rate by between three and four X, according to our calculations, in order to achieve this 1.5 degree future, but all of those retrofits need to be to zero carbon. And we know the solutions. We know what to do. We know how to decarbonize buildings. So it's just putting those best practices that Krista mentioned and, you know, designing all those, you know, getting those technologies that Bing mentioned out into our building stock. And, you know, that's, it's, that's going to take, you know, increasing, you know, incentives and, you know, streamlining economics and creating more one-stop shop models so that vendors are actually coming with, mm -hmm. You know, you're not hiring eight different vendors to do 10 different upgrades in your building. You're hiring one. And we have those models today. We just kind of, we need to amplify everything. And I think that's, um, it, it's daunting, but I think we're better positioned to do that now than we ever have been in the past. We have, you know, we have the know-how and we have kind of, momentum on the workforce side and on the policy side and so I, I, it really does feel right now like things are clicking into place and um, I'm, I'm confident we're going to get there. Yeah Kara I think your comment about scale um, it, it got me thinking a little bit about the importance of regional markets and supply chains you know if we want to build this one percent retrofit rate and scale that up at zero carbon you know, just to make sure our audience understands, we're also talking about embodied carbon and operating carbon considerations. Those two things must be packed together. And in order to be able to achieve even just the embodied carbon piece, we need to be thinking about locally sourced materials, products, and services. And so I think it would be wonderful to someday hear that policies like Buy American uh, First would be extended to maybe like buy carbon free first or something where we really incentivize the market to produce more locally sourced materials and goods and equipment. Uh, Jeremy, over to you. Challenges that you see in this space. Yeah, no, I mean, thanks, Fernando. And I think, you know, there, there's a bit of, there's nuggets of truth in kind of, I think, the different pieces and what everyone said. I think for me, one of the things, and this goes back to when I was a Peace Corps volunteer over 20 years ago, you know, is the ability to listen. And you mentioned many times about, or kind of, if you look at the whole building life cycle, to Kara's talk about scale, all those things mean that there are a lot of different people involved in our industry, uh, from the inkling of a, an idea for, for a new building and a location, the whole way to maintaining a building for 50 or 100 years like we do at GSA. There's a lot of different people. They come with different perspective. And you know, one of the things that I learned really early on straight out of school when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, the great example, of, I couldn't speak the language, so I had to listen a lot. And then you start to, you start to watch what people do and why they do things. And I think that that's a really important part, uh, you know, just as, Folks that are in our buildings, I mean, the purpose for them being there, you know, in, in our case, serving the American public, serving different missions. We're there to provide an efficient, effective and sustainable real estate for them to do the people's business. And I think, that, you know, just as important as you have, those are in those are in the communities. So all of those different stakeholders, you know, have a voice. And I think, you know, not only um, in terms of how we operate now, but I think even more so. I'm looking at, you know, if we talk about the climate crisis, both the opportunity and the challenges with those, they're, they're, they're this, both sides of the same coin. Um, something came to mind, I mean, I, I, you know, even something as simple as being at home, you know, I, I probably my better half indulges my, my use of our, our primary residence as kind of a, a, you know, its own laboratory or science experiment sometimes. One of the things that I ended up doing was going through and looking at, I mean, this is six years ago, pre-Tesla Powerwall, any of this, putting in, looking at alternatives, not just for putting in solar PV and sizing it and working the efficiency in my own residence, but then looking at microgrid options and how do I meet those? And very pragmatic things like, 
to sump pumps. If I don't have a sump pump and there's no power, I get flooded out, $10,000 bill right off the bat. So looking at all those options and uh, just something even with my own family, father asked me, well, why are you putting this, this green PV system in? And I'm talking to where, where he's at, it's like, well, actually I looked at backup generators. I looked at all these options. If you were going to put in solar, I have two sump pumps. Those are basic resiliency. If the power goes out, I'm spending a lot of money in disrupting and causing potential health issues with mold, you know, if I have floods in the house. Doing that provides me a lot of flexibility and peace of mind, and it's far cheaper to kind of build that in as I was looking at the system. So I think, you know, just an illustrative example of like even in our own conversations within our families, we have different points of view. I think within our industry, that's also true. And to Kara's earlier point, facility managers being at that the nexus of many of listening to those voices, understanding where they're coming from. Again, greenhouse gas sounds like something very esoteric to them making it about the operations of the building, making it about their tenants, doing their job, making that building the best building it can be. I think, you know, while I'm a data guy like in, in engineering and technology, ultimately this shift is as much about people as it is hardware. It's much about locations and communities as it is about these assets. So I think that that's a really important takeaway. It's both the challenge, but also the opportunity. Right, right, Jeremy. And I mean, I think similar to your story about your family reacting to some of your, uh, you know, Tesla laboratory tinkering at home, um, I think it is really actually a, a, an important um, observation that you do have to, us as professionals in the industry, we do have to meet people where they're at. And I think the experience of residential energy efficiency might be the most closest to all of us, renters or homeowners. And so I, I would love to be able to think of this as, you know, if residential consumers can understand the value proposition of reducing carbon, because it also reduces their utility bill, that conversion between carbon and greenhouse gas reduction and cost reduction, I think that that's a message that should be really well developed and expanded for every sector so that institutional, academic, federal, commercial, all of these different kinds of building product types can understand where the carbon concept plays into something that's very germane to them, which is, you know, how much money can they save and, and retain as part of their capital or reinvest in other ways, you know, the trade-offs with investing uh, early up front and saving later, same as the energy efficiency space did. So with that, I was also inspired to share a little bit about m one of my personal sort of uh, uh, fun facts as I segue into talking about jobs. So when we think about what kind of jobs or what kind of skills we'll need, I was reminded that as a young man, I was a, a army tank mechanic and I fixed tanks and trucks, US Army for three years. And I'm still benefiting from the skills that I learned through that service. And so when we think about skilling up or offering folks paths to economic ladders, especially when we think in the equity space, you know, what kind of jobs do the speakers here think we'll need, or what kind of new skills might we need to operate carbon-free buildings, whether they're residential or larger buildings? And um, I'll start uh, in a different order. I will maybe begin with Krista. Krista, perhaps you can kick us off thinking about what kind of jobs or what kind of training might we need in order for us to operate carbon-free buildings? Yeah, thanks. That's such a great question because we are looking at this massive shift in how we orient ourselves right as employers or as employees involved with with the with the built environment i think you know as i think back over the years to some of the um orientations of employers or employees in the built environment that were most successful in reducing energy usage not looking at emissions at that point but but energy usage we're tying performance incentives to 
energy usage reduction, you know? And I think um, as employers in, in the building sector, I think it will really be necessary for us to reevaluate our job descriptions and um, critical roles around how they are tied to emissions, you know? So looking at what skills and activities um, involved in unit turnovers in multifamily buildings or with the service providers that we hire to service our uh, heating and cooling equipment. Um, how can we explicitly evaluate those links to emissions um, and tie performance incentives to reducing our, you know, to decarbonization explicitly? I think even with the same, even if we're only looking at the same generic types of, of positions that we're familiar with today, it will be critical for us to reevaluate how we'll be rewarding performance, mm -hmm. what our goal will be, you know, tied explicitly to decarbonization. You know, making it real by, by counting it um, is something that I think will be really important. I agree, yeah. So p folks that are able to really understand some of the metrics and maybe perhaps even think about performance of their work as a component of that. Yes. And I yes. wonder, Bing, over to you. What kind of jobs or training do you see we might want to consider so that we have a lot of ambassadors and operators out there in the world that can kind of also act on this challenge? Yeah. Well, this moving our economy to clean energy economy in future, it, it does create a tremendous opportunity for us to have really good paid job domestically. Um, I can think about a few examples down here. On the supply chains, right, we're starting to see emerging use of triple pin windows. We really need the domestic manufacturers to know how to make and we can buy same triple pin windows from your local Home Depot today. I know it's more commonly available in Europe and we need to bring, I, I know there's a, only a small amount of boutique uh, manufacturer can make it. We need to find a way to scale that up to have other manufacturers see that as a business case. Uh, I have another interesting personal story is really about to grow our construction workforce to be able to really helping us on their new technologies. So I was motivated to change my uh, um, gas uh, water heater uh, with heat pump water heater by living in Portland. You know, we have nice incentives offered by the utility, you can imagine. And I cannot find contractor install heat pump water heater because most of them, they don't know how to do it. And that there's a ton of them know how to do it. It's a very long waiting list. So mm -hmm. we have a technology, we can afford it, and we need workforce to helping us to implement it. And I also a lot of them think about, you know, I'm gonna I like to retire in certain time. So I like to think about what's the next generation. We really need ramping up our workforce from trades, you know, from their unions, really bring for them to see this is a very high value uh, areas to working on and also to grow the younger workforce, you know, from the school perspective as well. Um, that will be a few things. I think it's the, the entire spectrum of from supply chain to installers and not mentioned to research, et cetera. So I think this really open up opportunity for us to grow on a lot of for high paid jobs. And I, I also see their um, Congress have a, um, the budget, you know, preparation for next years. There's going to be concert effort to put investment to helping pro, provide on-site free training on the workforce growth in the clean energy areas as well. Yeah, I would definitely think that your lab campus has, you know, great opportunities to translate some of the technical terms yeah. to, um, especially, you know, young start programs with. Uh, high school and college and trade school attendees and folks that maybe we could really understand how to apply some of the technologies that you all see in the lab, but also in, in the various cities where we all live, really. You know, there's so many different programs that we could also look at, ensuring that we are accommodating some of this knowledge resource for both 
technical professionals and some of the more trade or craft professionals so that we have both types of workforces invested in. So Jeremy, over to you. Uh, what kinds of jobs or training do you see we might want to include here? Oh, I mean, I, I think, you know, ultimately come back to kind of our three P's and I know Krista and Bing had talked already about it. You know, one is the performance. Uh, I think that's a really important part of it. Second is the, the partnerships. Uh, I think, you know, GSA, obviously we have, you know, many contracts. We, we, we actually use the term partnering with our, with our, with our contractors, whether that's building a new building, whether that is our operations and maintenance contractors. And then, you know, really that, you know, going at the focus being the people. And I think that's, you know, it's not, it's not only the jobs, it's the, the impact, the sort of doing folks working on these things. They have a vision. I, I go back to, I mean, again, I was a Peace Corps guy, so obviously have, um, you know, it goes back to, to President Kennedy. He had a vision, whether talking about the Peace Corps or whether about the moonshot, you know, and it spurred an entire generation of high tech industry, but most of all, the people that ended up, you know, engaging on that for for unity of effort, learning what we needed to do along the way, investing in the education, and I think that that is very similar to where we're at now. Uh, as we look to transform our building stock, we know that we need to invest and really work, especially on on trades, uh, construction, but also the the folks that can work across that, the data scientists that understand how our our building automation systems work, or how we go through and do sort of that macro analysis, but also just about how our buildings work. Really, I think getting, I mean, even my kids, my younger colleagues excited about buildings and how things go together, how they can work, but also not just how they work now, but how they could work in the future. Uh, and really taking, not only having that excitement, but I think also that opportunity, uh, you know, and really being able to, you know, have folks in the communities that we serve and work in be part of that team. And whether that's, you know, on the federal workforce side, whether that's uh, on the contract side, I think making a concerted effort that will serve all of those partnerships well, because people will be able to contribute to this broader transformation, but I think also make a good living doing it and mm -hmm. you know, learning how to do things better and building things, which I think is really that constructive vision and kind of as we would you know, work towards this, that opportunity we really need to bring out the best of American workers. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was thinking, Jeremy, like when we think about our families and our extended families, there are some skills that we can you know, translate from both this industry perspective, just you know, and sharing it with the, our loved ones. And I was reminded of how uh, practical I am in my family. So before I, I turn it over to Kara to um, talk about jobs, I wanted to just share with you all. Um, when I was younger, I learned how to replace flip switches in my apartment. And I became the most popular family member for helping uh, all of my family uh, install dimmers. And so it's a skill that I've kept up for years and years just because I know how to turn off a circuit breaker and put that in. So I feel like there's small skills. Sometimes it's kind of a part of the life skills package in my mind. They don't have to be a whole training program. You show up, you know, and you've got all these credentials, et cetera, because I do think that there's a lot of barriers sometimes towards that kind of understanding of trades and technical training and certifications. We need that too. So I just wanted to make sure with my comment here that I would offer and humanize the fact that training and jobs and skills, we're talking about a wide spectrum of considerations. I would even wager to say that green infrastructure, landscaping, learning how to plant things and how to grow green things is an important skill that will contribute to the decarbonization of the built environment because we just will simply be utilizing less heating and less air conditioning to an extent, you know? So, Carol, over to you, as you and I think about uh, this, like, final thought on uh, what kind of jobs and what kind of skills we might need. What are your thoughts on that? Fernando, I, I well said. I, I completely agree. I think this is this is a conversation of, of yes and. Like, we need all of these pieces and more. You know, if we've talked about scaling, 
I think we need that similar three to four X, if not even five X expansion on our workforce side, um, if we need to see those results in buildings. And I think, you know, my head is, is rooted in New York on this topic, and they have some fantastic training programs, over 500 workforce development programs across the state, and they're meeting people where they are. You know, a quarter of those programs are online. Um, there are half of those programs are colleges and university levels, and then there are training programs offered in VOTEC schools, um, and they're offered throughout the state. And I think what, what we're finding is it's really um, this ramp up in decarbonization retrofits, that's going to result in hundreds of thousands of jobs. I mean, if, if we're talking a, a three to five X increase in the workforce, which in New York State right now is about 150,000 energy related jobs, we're talking half a million jobs in this field. And that's everything from energy efficiency technicians and providers, to renewable electric power generation folks, clean alternative transportation, renewable fuels, heat pump installers, grid modernization and energy storage, offshore wind. I mean, I think that there's there's so many interesting fields that require, you know, as Fernando said, all levels of technical aptitudes uh, to really make this work. And I think you know, as Krista noted, we need to start by building by building up those trades um, in disadvantaged communities. And first, you know, first and foremost, let's focus on how we can, you know, raise raise the um, help those folks where they're at and kind of build in livelihood opportunities for them um, mm -hmm. in doing this. So mm -hmm. it's a really I know, Kara, like here here in DC, we have a well, one working model, I would say, and um, Krista, perhaps you know a little bit more about this than even I have learned, but um, the Infrastructure Academy and the mayor's initiative to also scale up uh, job training and some of the disadvantaged communities. And, you know, in case you do have a thought or two about Infrastructure Academy, keep it in mind and remember to come back to it. I don't want to put you on the spot on something that we haven't initially talked about. But I get excited definitely about pathways to um, you know, meaningful and well-paying jobs. Apparently, this space is is one of those contributions to the overall quality of life by reducing our environmental impact and demand on natural resources. People really kind of walk away feeling good about themselves, about the work that they do, and there is a trajectory for high demand in that space. So, Krista, just quick, any uh, thoughts about Infrastructure Academy? Is that something that you've kind of looked into in the past or heard something about? You know, I am not familiar with the DC's Infrastructure Academies, but I jotted down a note and will be looking it up after <laughs> our call. Um, models, um, um, a model, a different model that I am familiar with is um, the great work that the Emerald Cities Collaborative is really creating high roads pathways um, for economic trajectory for, for workers in this space. So I'll throw that out as another resource that um, folks might be interested in looking up. Emerald Cities, gotcha. Okay, and now I'm just going to pivot to one or two questions that I've got so far started. And um, this is an invitation for all the different speakers to contribute. And I'll just help by uh, punting the question over to one of you to get it all started. So the question came in asking about our need to address finance. Um, the writer says, there's a fragmentation of the building industry and construction process related to equity. Um, how can we solve the fragmentation challenge? So wondered what the fragmentation challenge means to you all, and perhaps I can start with Jeremy, and then I'll leave it open to whoever wants to jump in and add some more thoughts. Jeremy, what do you think? Fragmentation, sure. finance, those kinds of things. Yeah, now obviously uh, working on it from a public sector perspective uh, may be a different flavor, but I don't think it's, it, it's, it's not connected uh, as well. Ultimately, I mean, in, in, in public buildings, we have our appropriation, we, we do collect rent. We do go through that from our federal agencies and it goes to our, our federal buildings fund. But, but all of that all of that funding is then appropriated. So uh, ultimately, you know, there is sort of, I think to Kara's earlier point, you know, sometimes a mismatch between the timing of when we get capital uh, to when we would actually probably need it. So we end up running sometimes, you know, the, the chiller that should have been probably changed out five years ago or 10 years ago. 
And what it does in, in many ways when you have um, that mismatch from the, fi from the financial capital versus, you know, what you have versus what you need at the right time, you end up, you know, I think dipping into those where we have the fragment, fragmented, oh, this is for, this is funding for building new buildings, for modernization, this is for renovations, or this is from operations. And I think when those things don't connect or because of the way that they're set up, and this could be private sector or public sector, um, we don't get to take advantage of some of the, the, the right timing and uh, some of the, the issues we run into because we robbed Peter to pay Paul. We're going to spend a lot of money doing an emergency fix uh, to keep it running, but then that ends up having a, a flip side effect on the overall uh, capital available. So, I mean, I think that that's one of the areas, at least from you know where I'm familiar of, where it does become, it's fragmented, but I don't think it's limited to just government. I think probably in the private sector as well, when, you know, what are the time horizons, what's your rate of return, all of those different things come into play, but ultimately your impact with different drivers is the same. So open mic, if any of the other speakers have a comment about financing or thinking about fragmentation in the industry perhaps, um, that connects the dots between logistics operations and funding. But then I can share a little bit. I treat that actually as opportunity. You know, um, I'm sure um, Carol uh, maybe mentioned that and some other um, panelists, uh, Teresa might mention that at the beginning is, we view in the last, it's just started about last a uh, few years ago, we started to see a quite emerging new policy um, to actually require your existing building to meet a certain performance, either energy or carbon or energy star scores. It's a, it's a different matrix, but it's all holding accountability of performance of your existing building through the years. You know, New York City has a local law, 97 Washington State passed legislation recently. You know, DC is also one, one of the leading city and Colorado passed legislation. We really see such emerging, very powerful policy to really uh, not give us a chance to decarbonize our existing building. It's more important from my perspective is to set up this more stable long-term vision planning, including financial planning. If you know you're building at a risk to pay the fine down the road in five years, in 10 years, it really motivates to think about holistic. Maybe you starting to develop more financial decision kind of plan, right? If you have a portfolio of the building or even single buildings, right? Next year, lighting retrofit. In five years, uh, you know, HVAC update. And in 10 years, window replacement, you have this guarantee and, you know, plan. And since you know the plan ahead of time, it's helping to attract the third party with the financial assistance as well, because they know it's guaranteed the market is there with the payback. So I think the building performance standards will be a new policy kind of helping pave a, a new way to, to attract their financial assistance, you know, for the for the retrofit, for the cost effectiveness, we've been struggling for decades. Maybe that's really something new. I'm 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 actually working on that, you know, um, quite excited as well to see that happening. If are there any other thoughts before I uh, move to another question? I'll, I'll just add something else in the mix under the theme of um, fragmentation of financing and somewhat related to what Bing was saying here. You know, in the affordable housing sector, um, uh, putting together a deal <laughs> to get an affordable housing development off the ground is incredibly complex. You know, <laughs> requires dozens of, of sources. Um, and yet at the same time, many of those sources are from housing organizations and are for housing and haven't traditionally considered um, energy budgets in the way that we're talking about them here, let alone emissions profiles. And we're starting to see different green banks around the country provide resources that can be an untraditional source within the housing capital stack 
um, to make these types of upgrades that we're talking about, which are necessary for decarbonization actually feasible. Um, but, um, you know, aligning the terms and the funding cycles between those energy related sources and the housing sources is something that um, folks are having to work out in some cases on a deal by deal basis right now. So <laughs> taking the bigger picture of how we can bring together um, and de-silo, you know, these, these different sources, I think, I think will be really critical. And, and there are some great examples out there right now from what New York's Green Bank is doing. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Connecticut and, and others. So there are some models to follow, but um, to Kara's earlier point about scale, <laughs> we're going to need to do this much more frequently and often. And you do bring up a good point for me, Krista, which is that the various green banks across m m various jurisdictions, you know, in DC, we have a green bank. There's, there's an opportunity for green banks to uh, enact as a sort of a translator of value propositions between both the the funding mechanisms and the various ways in which the uh, banking community might need to be thinking about this or various paths of uh, accruing capital and producing capital um, so that we can uh, execute on some of these important goals, especially the scale that we're talking about. So as a preview, our next panel discussion uh, on real estate will likely focus on some of these asset level uh, investment type of, of themes on the conversation. So I think it'll be a great complement to what we're talking about today. But I do have for us the final question, which actually I save for the last because it's the most provocative question that has come through. And so I'm going to invite all speakers to reflect on this question. Uh, but I hope that it, it produces some interesting thoughts for all of us. And so here we go. The writer says, have you had any difficult conversations with colleagues, clients, or building owners? For example, pushing to do something innovative or different and uh, experiencing um, challenges or resistance. How did you navigate that? So again, difficult conversations with colleagues, clients, or building owners about carbon-free buildings, perhaps operating carbon-free buildings. And I said I would cue this up for a person. So Kara, why don't you, uh, not to put you on the top first, but you know, if, if you're open to it, why don't you kick us off on some of your reflections on that question? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question because I think there's still um, a lot of those hard conversations that need to happen in the industry. And I, I would, I would say that we, um, in order to succeed, we need more champions. And so we need more building owners who are on the skeptic side, who can come forth and say, yes, actually this, this could work, or it, this part didn't work, but this part did work. So in terms of a specific case, um, I guess I would maybe think of an office building that we worked on here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, it's an all electric, you know, zero energy office building. We have PV on the roof and on the facade, and it's kind of, it's all tricked out. It's it's doing great things, but um, it's, we still have huge demand charges that end up being kind of, that are over half of the utility bill each month. And we're talking about providing electric vehicle parking for all of the parking spaces in the garage. And that could, again, increase um, increase our demand charges. And so, um, I think it really became about the bottom line and like how can we make decarbonization cost effective? And what we've been working with with the landlord is looking at alternative financing models. You know, PACE is fantastic and it's, you know, commercial and residential and it's tried and true and we know it. And also, you know, emerging um, models where uh, as a service, models where you're paying as you know over time as you go or having um, battery storage and managed charging that's an option that we're looking at to kind of defray those costs so that they would be um, it's not kind of an upfront fee by the landlord which would then have to be passed to tenants and kind of the split incentive we could just navigate it and it would just be kind of a fixed operational payment that would get rolled into rent charges so I guess to this question in the previous, I think there are some really exciting emerging finance models 
um, that are going to help us get over this um, this economic challenge that we, you know, to be honest and candid, it's uh, it's not smooth sailing yet today. In a lot of instances, it can, and it it you know it can be, um, and these financing models can help us get there. Mm-hmm. Fernando, I can take that because I think, you know, mm-hmm. to, to Kara's comment, I mean, one of the things I think for difficult conversations, especially if you're kind of looking at this, is show me the money. And I think that that when you, you know, try to have that thoughtful argument, I think, again, where you, you know, understand where pe- try, trying to understand where people are coming from, you know, what are those things that they value? And I think that that's, that's part of the conversation. Difficult conversations, I think, you, know, you can come to kind of you know, a joint vision on things that have those different benefits, even if there are some costs with it. Um, you know, some of the things and I think about, you know, more, more difficult conversations haven't been where I'm having the dollars and cents conversations. I'm a data guy. I love to have those. Uh, but I think it's more of like, how oh, do you work with sometimes with colleagues that, well, I, you know, we, we need to do this. I'm like, so it's like, but I always, I always try to say, you know, let's think about the other, the person you need to partner with, the the folks that you are engaging with in order to make this successful in terms of whether you're dealing with a project or portfolio transformation, regardless. Look at it from their perspective. And, you know, I think some of those are early experiences, you know, Peace Corps and others really come back because I said, anytime I wanted to make a persuasive argument, one, when I was in the Peace Corps, I didn't speak Slovak well enough to make a persuasive argument. So they come just straight, straight logic. But I think working with our colleagues, sometimes those are the hardest, even if you're pulling in the same direction, how to be have productive engagements on those. Again, being a leader serving a team. Uh, you know, anytime I hear someone say, I believe that passion is you it's really, it's really good, it's important, but it also trying to work folks together to have those different perspectives, sometimes having conversations with the friends, those that share your passions, you know, to get them, it's like, let's work this on a productive area, because I think those can be really difficult. It's like, we have to look at it from the people we need to partner with and their perspective. And, you know, that probably for me has been probably the more difficult conversations, because you're like, I appreciate your passion. That's great. I even agree where you're going. Let's figure out how to make sure that we're bringing everyone along, because being out there in the cold, or being kind of the lone, the, the lone wolf doesn't actually get the job done. We we succeed as a team, we fail as a team. Mm-hmm. You know, and as we keep talking about responses here, what you were just saying, Jeremy, makes me think about all of these kind of soft skills as what we call air quotes, soft skills. If we don't have proper change management processes and bringing the human element into the persuasion, the information and alignment piece, becomes a little bit competitive with various egos, perhaps, or personalities that have very strong opinions, which are counterproductive, you know? So the the human dimension, I really think that that's actually a nice insight here. We need to think about not just the technical challenges of overcoming uh, an increasingly volatile climate and all these impacts related to the environment, but at the end of the day, it's also a lot about people processes and, and moving um, folks together forward, right? So Bing, Krista, any ideas as well here in terms of, again, the question related to difficult conversations you've had with colleagues, clients, or building owners about this topic? Um, I will go first. Um, the most, you know, as a researcher in the national lab, I found that this is the most challenging um, the difficulties is how you disassemble dissemble your very complicated technologies to your sponsor and the client and can relate to them as well and helping them to make uh, fact-driven, data-driven decisions. So um, this also tied into the soft skills because as engineers, we have been really trained real uh, well, on the dive in the details and on the analysis, uh, and what we have been learning most of the time, like myself, in the hard way on the soft skill is when you, you know, try to sell your idea or convince other people on your research ideas to make that at a scale, you know, you know, to uh, to applicable, 
you actually have to embed all the things you love, all the technical details, all the data and data to appendix, and then leave up what 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 it matters, why, what's the mm -hmm. outcome, explain in a way every people can understand it. That's I think I'm still working on that as well. Um, a funny part on the on the on the personal side, um, we have a debate. My husband is a very shining technology driven person. He want to put a PV on the roof. With the same of money, I think we should put insulation on the roof. And so we st <laughs> I still have that debate I, as a between this. So that's that's actually triggered the question is if you have a competing technology, right? You all have a good heart in terms of brain efficiency, decarbonization, right? What is optimized decision? You know, what's the process process to drive into the optimized, you know, thinking of the decisions from the financial point of view? I think this is pretty hard. I'm still struggling on that. And I would love to learn from all of you how to drive <laughs> to a better consensus. <laughs> Krista, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I think, you know, the most difficult conversation that I have is, is a perennial one about optimizing, providing the maximum number of affordable housing units so that everyone in the country who can be housed <laughs> um, versus um, ensuring that all of these units are, are going to be decarbonized and resilient and healthy and energy efficient, you know, for as long as they stand up. And, you know, there's this, on the one hand, argument to minimize upfront costs to the greatest extent so that you can maximize the number of units that you build. But on the other hand, you have to keep in mind, you know, the long-term affordability and, and actually not just long-term affordability, but long-term habitability mm -hmm. um, for the homes that we're, we're creating. And so, you know, that is that is the question we're always working to solve for, to optimize with with the affordable housing developers that, that we work with. And um, I think when explicitly this question of decarbonization comes up, sometimes we have to look at a middle ground um, between um, rather than all or nothing concerns. So, for instance, if it is really not financially feasible to create an all electric building, um, can you at least make it all electric ready by ensuring that you have more electric service installed um, at the building, for instance, so that when the time is right to replace appliances, you can switch from gas to electric? Um, or, you know, the, the age-old um, practice of making buildings solar ready, so at least you have the infrastructure there, so when the financials make sense, you can, you can put on the solar. So I think creating a path um, to get to the end goal and having some middle ground options sometimes is a way to solve for those, those difficult questions, but we're still answering them one by one. Well, I've definitely have taken a lot away from our discussion today, and I think one final comment I have to wrap up this segment as we then pivot to our final remarks is I'm reminded of a early maxim I learned in um, my career, which is, you know, don't make perfect the enemy of the good. You know, the idea of a half full pragmatic approach that's incremental. I think that even just having that attitude as industry mates, I think it's, it's essential because really it's how we help to move this concept forward. And I think when I when I listen especially to Bing's comments and trying to understand how to unpack or make less technically intimidating uh, the topic, I, I would just invite all of us to reflect on, based on all of these discussion uh, points that you heard today from uh, all of our speakers, to really reflect on how what we're really talking about here is improving the quality of life that we can experience in homes, buildings, and communities. So it's really not about, you know, a lot of smart tech and things that seem foreign and complex and someone else can manage, but it's really about a variety of ways in which we can improve the quality of life for ourselves, our families, and for our, our communities. At the same time that we're thinking about, for example, avoiding things that we know can 
impact and damage quality of life, as we've learned with lead paint, asbestos, and other kinds of complex, dangerous, hazardous types of materials. So when we think about decarbonizing the built environment, both from an embodied carbon as well as an operating carbon concept, there's just a lot of areas where it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And hopefully from today's discussion, you uh, gleaned some of those ideas. So now I'm going to take a moment to thank all of my fantastic industry colleagues and I appreciate you being on our panel for today. We're going to bid them farewell for now and I'm going to invite Teresa Backus to join me one more time as we close out today's program. Teresa, so what did you think today? Thank you so much. That was that was an insightful and energizing conversation. Um, I loved hearing everyone's perspectives and the anecdotes and the stories. I think you know it was the, it was a very compelling discussion and great questions from our audience as well. So I want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank you, audience, for your engagement. Um, thank you so much for attending. We will be sending you the link to today's event recording, the summary and, and key takeaways. So, so keep an eye open for those follow-up resources. Um, and Fernando, I, I believe we have a, also keep a lookout for our upcoming news on our October panel that you mentioned earlier. Um, we'll be pivoting and focusing on early stages of a building's life cycle. So real estate and developing carbon-free buildings. So we're really looking forward to that. And, Thank you so much, Fernando, too, for your facilitation. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed today's discussion. I thoroughly enjoy bringing this program to our colleagues in our industry. And um, yes, I want to thank uh, the Building Innovation Hub, as well as my Clark team supporting me, uh, really working through to deliver this fine program for you today. With that, I want to say thank you and see you at the next panel discussion.